So you can see we've been working on understanding um, the different stages, three different stages of the Calvin cycle uh, involved in photosynthesis. We uh, discussed carboxylation, which is where carbon dioxide becomes fixed to a ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, that's the CO2 acceptor, during CO2 fixation or carboxylation, resulting in the synthesis of 3-PGA. So for every CO2 molecule entering the cycle, two times that amount of product here is produced. Uh, also, we want to make sure we see here that for every um, CO2 entering, it's fixed by uh, a sa the same number of um, CO2 acceptors, RUBP. So there's a one-to-one -one ratio between CO2 and, and CO2 acceptor. And so we walked through the, uh, after the carboxylation stage, the reduction stage, which involves both um, phosphorylation by ATP as well as reduction by NADPH. Um, and again, there's a one-to-one -one ratio between the reactant that enters the reduction stage, 3PGA, the number of ATPs and NADPHs that are consumed in that stage, and the number of products from that stage, which is now glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, or G3P. So if we're following six carbon dioxides through the cycle, we end up with twice as many um, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates, which in this case is 12, Two of those glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates, and remember this is a 3-carbon molecule, um, two of those can be exported, um, and the rest move on into the regeneration stage. So that's uh, 10 that are remaining that uh, move on into the regeneration. And that's regeneration of this, RU, uh, this RUBP, this ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. And you can see that the amount that's going to be regenerated is going to end up equaling the amount of CO2 that can enter the cycle. So uh, we did a, a, an accounting of carbons to see that for 10, 3, 10 glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates, it's going to produce 6 ribulose 5-phosphates and ultimately 6 ribulose 1,5-bisphosphates. So this is where the numbers can get a little confusing, but if you just keep in mind the number of carbons we're looking at, and then there's a whole series of steps here um, that involve recombining the carbons into a, a, you know, from 10 molecules into six, um, which we're not going into in the, in the details in this diagram. All right, so we get to this point in the regeneration stage where glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, 10 of them, is converted into six ribulose 5-phosphates. And here's the molecular formula. This is a five-carbon molecule. There's one phosphate group in ribulose 5-phosphate. All right, and then this regeneration stage then utilizes uh, ATP, a one-to-one -one relationship between the number of ribulose, or ratio between the number of ribulose 5-phosphates and the number of ATPs. ATP phosphorylates this ribulose 5-phosphate, uh, and then we can see that the product there is ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. So you compare this molecular formula with this one up here, which is RUBP. This is RUP. Uh, and you can see that that phosphorus group has been added. This was the original one in RU, um, RUP. All right, so the regeneration stage does consume ATP molecules. Uh, in fact, it consumes half the number of, RU, of um, ATP molecules as the reduction stage. Okay, so we end up with six ribulose 1,5-bisphosphates, or basically the same number of RUBPs as CO2 molecules that enter the cycle. So one thing that we need to add to our uh, diagram now are the enzymes. Um, that catalyze various steps in the um, conversion of intermediates through the Calvin cycle. And the enzymes then end up becoming important for regulating the Calvin cycle. So a very important enzyme that occurs right here, we're going to highlight this in red, um, which uh, um, catalyzes the uh, fixation of CO2 with uh, RUBP, is, and we'll write it up here, is referred to as Rubisco. And Rubisco is uh, available in high quantities. It um, is, is probably the most abundant protein in the world, essentially, um, because of its ability to fix carbon dioxide in photosynthesis. Uh, so it's a very important uh, enzyme. All right, so this um, 
you can see this, this carboxylation stage does not involve ATP, so it's, it's uh, energetically favorable as long as Rubisco is available and activated. And we'll talk about the activators for, for Rubisco. Another enzyme that is involved in um, the Calvin cycle that we want to take note of is, is one that occurs right here during phosphorylation of 3-phosphoglycerate and that enzyme is referred to as 3-phosphoglycerate kinase. So 3-phosphoglycerate kinase, uh, and where we could abbreviate 3-PGA kinase. Um, and so that catalyzes the reaction um, where 3-phosphoglycerate is phosphorylated by ATP. Uh, another enzyme that we need to take note of is right here in the reduction step, which is um, referred to as um, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. And remember, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is, um, is our product there, so it just carries the same name, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate All right, so that enzyme catalyzes the reduction of 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, this molecule here, to uh, glyceraldehyde, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. So it removes the phosphorus as it adds the electrons um, from NADPH. Uh, and then the last enzyme that we want to take note of is at this other point of um, ATP phosphorylation of RUP, ribulose phosphate, or ribulose 5-phosphate, to ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. And so that um, enzyme is called phosphoribulose kinase. So the two, the two enzymes that are catalyzing ATP phosphorylation are kinase um, enzymes. These are the enzymes that are going to come in play when it comes to uh, activating and regulating the Calvin cycle. So this pretty much summarizes um, all, the, all the steps that are involved in the Calvin cycle that you're responsible for. Um, what you'll want to make sure that you're keeping accounting of is um, to be able to count the carbons in the intermediates. to also count the, the number of ATPs and NADPHs that are used um, in the cycle. And this is all relative to the number of CO2 molecules that enters the cycle, so that's going to vary depending on the number of CO2s in the cycle. Uh, and then um, the number of, or let's say, where um, phosphates, phosphate groups uh, are located. The number of phosphate groups, or the no or at the time when phosphate groups are added to an intermediate, and that helps you kind of keep an accounting and understanding of what the steps, uh, the purpose of each of the steps are. All right. Um, also, it's helpful to go on to a diagram that's not filled in and try to recreate all of these um, steps and intermediates and follow the carbons, the number of carbons, the number of phosphates when they're added or taken away, um, the number of ATPs and NADPHs that are utilized, and to label the different um, stages. So this is a very good um, diagram to practice uh, your understanding of the Calvin cycle. So instead of just recopying everything, go back and fill in what you know, and then go back and look at the figure and, and add what you left out just to help. All right. Now the output of the um, Calvin cycle, as we said, is going to be the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. This is G3P. Um, it's also referred to as a triose uh, phosphate, meaning a, sh a three carbon sugar phosphate. And you can see it, gets, uh, it can be exported from the chloroplast into the stroma and then ultimately used to synthesize starch, although starch can be synthesized also in the chloroplast, um, and then also to produce uh, sucrose, which we already talked about, um, is then transported through phloem to various parts of the plant. So we'll be talking about uh, phloem transport of sucrose in another uh, topic. 
Um, so that brings us down to um, some of the regulators here that we want to talk about with the, regard to the Calvin cycle. Ultimately, the, one of the important regulators here is where G3P is uh, prioritized to synthesize RUBP, um, or regeneration of RUBP. Uh, and so that's an important regulator. So we're going to jot down here regulators of the Kelvin cycle. Uh, which has to do with which has to do with um, supply of carbon dioxide um, to G3P and then that leads to the regeneration of RUBP and this is going to um, be prioritized over the synthesis of starch and sucrose and glucose but we're going to spend more time here now discussing the regulation of the Calvin cycle by light. Um, so even though some people refer to it as the uh, light independent reactions, it is indeed um, relies on uh, and is regulated by light. So the first aspect of the regulation by light we're going to look at is the um, how light reactions um, cause or produce a pH gradient, which is a um, let's say a high pH or uh, ideally around 8 in the stroma and that leads to ideal activation of these stromal uh, enzymes of, of Calvin cycle enzymes um, versus a pH uh, in the lumen of about 5 so remember the pH drops as the, as the hydrogen ion concentration increases. Now the activation, the enzymes that are activated in the Calvin cycle by a, um, a pH of around 8 uh, include Rubisco uh, as well as G3P dehydrogenase and phosphoribulose kinase. So those are three that we're going to discuss anyway that are um, regulated or activated by a pH of 8 in the stroma. So that's one way that the light that light activates um, or rather regulates the Calvin cycle by by activating these enzymes. Uh, we're going to continue to talk in the next uh, video clip about um, the resulting pH differential across the membrane of the thylakoids uh, causes some movement of magnesium into the stroma to balance the electrochemical gradient. Uh, and then we'll uh, continue on with um, some other aspects of regulating the enzymes that control the, the uh, Calvin cycle. So those will be um, discussed in the next recorded lectures.